Turn with me to Mark 10, 35 to 45. We have the New Living Translation we'll be reading from. You can follow along whatever translation that you use. Okay. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request, he asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes. They replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who is to sit on my left or my right. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, asked they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. We've been at it for quite a while along the theme of getting to know Jesus, and we know that it's not going to end. Because we're followers of Jesus, and every Sunday, no matter what the sermon theme, whether it's from the Old Testament or the New Testament, whatever it is, it's always going to be about Jesus. But since Christmas, we've been talking about getting to know Jesus better, and it's just never going to stop. It's a lifelong task to know Jesus more and more, and the hymn writers certainly help us out on these kinds of things. And as you were sensing that this morning of the songs pointing to Jesus and the kingdom of heaven come down and all that stuff, it's all pointing to our relationship and how much we know about Jesus. Well, there's an old hymn, and I'm not going to sing it or ask you to sing it, but it, it, you know it. It goes, more about Jesus I would know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. I hope you have that kind of should I put it, a hook in you when you came to a relationship with, with the Lord, that it wasn't, wow, I'm here already. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and making me as good as you've done. You know, some people act that way. They get in a right relationship with God and they make it all about them. But folks, it's all about learning to be more like Jesus. And so our Bible stories that we've chosen, and we've been looking at them from the book of Mark, and of course, we jumped ahead a little bit to the end of Book of Mark for, for the uh, Easter season, but now we came back to some of the, the, the stories on, on the way to Jerusalem. And this is another one of those stories. The, they're walking to Jerusalem. Jesus at, towards down south, down that from L L Galilee down to, to Jerusalem. And as they go, it's a walking seminar. Jesus is teaching as they walk sometimes and as they stop under the, at the wayside uh, 
you know, the rest stop along the highway there. They, they pull up to the picnic tables and they gather around and Jesus taught them. And uh, this is one of those times. And the theme, the real theme of, the, of this talk that Jesus had isn't in our story this morning, but it was just in the few verses I had. Again, he was talking about why they were going to Jerusalem. And it was profound, heavy stuff. Jesus going to die and, and be crucified and all that stuff. And, and the disciples, well, you could tell they were listening by their question. All right, they weren't listening, probably, because what a thing for the disciples to do. Well, now we've got ourselves, once again, into a wonderful teaching moment for Jesus. And not such a good teaching, not such a good, well, it doesn't show the, reflect so good on the disciples. Different disciples at different times have asked questions that, um, and, and even the rich young ruler last week asked a question that, well, if you've been hanging around with people for a long time, when somebody asks a stupid question, you don't have to say it's stupid, right? You just smile at them, and they know, okay? And I'm not going to say stupid because when we're taught in our house, you couldn't say stupid, okay? So I'm going to take it back. They didn't know what they were asking, and Jesus even says that in this story. They said, teacher, we have something we want to ask you. And they ask him like as if he's the genie out of the bottle. Are you going to give me three wishes? And you know, when your child asks you, daddy, do me a favor, do me a favor, and they don't want you to, and you say, okay, what is it? Well, no, you can't, I'm not going to ask until you tell me you're going to do it. You know, you've, you, you've got, gone through that old bargaining thing, right? you got to say yes before the question. And you go, oh, is this one of these times that these disciples, growing men, fishermen, learning from Jesus all these wonderful things, we want, we want you to do us a favor. Finally, Jesus says, yes. I will, what he says, what is your request? And then they ask. And I can't help but thinking that it took a little while for Jesus to say the next line because he was laughing. Now, it doesn't say that in the Bible, and maybe I'm out of, I, I, I'm going too far here that Jesus laughed at his disciples. But they were men, and they were buddies, and they traveled around together. There was probably lots of other moments where they had humorous times together. Like last week, he talked about a camel going through the eye of a needle. He, doesn't take very much imagination to see that that's funny. And the disciples asking this kind of question about the throne and where they're, where they're going to sit. And Jesus had just finished talking about how he was going to the Jerusalem to suffer. And it was so different than they had ever thought of. And, and yet they missed it. But they were so clearly self-centered. That's not a laughing matter. Humorous oftentimes when you see, catch somebody gets caught being so self-centered and you go, huh, now I know what they want, or that's all about them. We mock people like that. Not maybe to their faces, but this is the kind of situation where it was so clear that the disciples were only thinking about themselves. When that happens, and you're supposed to be working in a group, there's trouble. We see it often when strong personalities all think that they should get their own way. There's a clash. And it's a clash over who's in control. And this question doesn't, isn't a very sneaky question. It was, we want to be in control. That was what the favor was. Lord, make us, after you, and they were, were pretty good at this, setting Jesus on the throne, and they, we'll take, we'll, it's up to you which side we take. You just ask, give us one side and the other guy the other side. The most powerful places in all this kingdom that they were hearing about, the kingdom of God, and in the book of Matthew, and I preached from this before and had fun with it, because from the Matthew passage, there's even a better twist. They get their mother to ask this question. Remember that? We've talked about that. And I think that that's even worse, <clears throat> that they got their mother to do it. But we don't have, Mark doesn't report their mother's 
involvement on this. But the, when that happens in a group, when there's an absolute clear illustration of self-centered ambition, when it's in a group, it causes rivalries. People divide up into different groups. And there's arguments and there's disagreements. And the sad thing is it happens among believers. It was happening among the disciples. Rivalries and disagreements and arguments can be so destructive. They damage the goodwill and trust and peace. They damage the foundations of, of getting along together. When we're out for ourselves, looking out for our control, our uh, prestige. And that's what is happening here with the group. These rivalries also ha hamper the progress. Jesus must have felt when he heard from the disciples this silly question, or, or, or at least gave, let the dis Jesus know clearly, as, as if he didn't know already, but he heard it from their mouths, and the other disciples overheard it too, that these guys, after all this stuff that Jesus had taught about putting others first and looking after, caring for everybody else, the disciples said, what about us? We want to be number one. Peter kind of did that in the last week's sermon too, where he says, well, we're been, we left home and, and what about us? Are we going to take care of it? And Jesus didn't go hard on Peter last week. He just warned them that they're going to have 100 times what they got now and with a big smile. And then he said, and pain and suffering. But Jesus understood how destructive these arguments were among his group. And he often talked about unity and love. In his final prayer in the garden, Jesus said, the goal is for all of them, all of my disciples, to become one heart and mind. This is Jesus talking to his heavenly father. And he says, just as you, father, are in me and I in you, so they might be one heart and mind with us. Then the world might believe that you are in fact, that you in fact sent me. The cure for this kind of ambition and self-centeredness, the only cure is the kingdom living of putting other people first. And that becomes so practical that it's bothersome to all of us. We don't have to go to, to study theology. We don't have to hear all the, the fancy arguments. The teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, center around the fact that there's a change in us so that we're not looking out for ourselves. We're looking out for others first. That's not complicated. Sometimes that we wish that there was a whole lot more complication to this so that we could say, oh, I'm too tired. I stay up too late last night. I don't know what the, the pastor's saying. It, that when you talk about Bible things, it gets complicated, and I can't understand. I'm just a simple guy. Well, folks, this is not complicated. It's either you or others. In the decisions you're making for this afternoon, tomorrow, for the next week, the thoughts that you have, the momentary decisions that you get to make, if you have practiced and you ask the Lord to enter you and, and you sense his spirit inside you, then the question it will come up often. Is this for me or can, is it for others? Is this just to make me feel good or is it just all about me? That's the cure. Jesus has an answer for them. And he answers and talks about after he heard their questions and maybe in the midst of his asking, and Mark, this business of ink and paper and stuff, and, and the, they wrote it on papyrus and, and, and then handed it down and after years and, and Gutenberg made a press so that we could, have, we could all read it and all that kind of stuff, but it's still flat. It's still just got ink and we got to look at it and it's just, a, just words. But the word of God is living. And the, one of the ways for me to remember that it's living is that I'm living, otherwise I couldn't read it. And my mind's got to be really going to be able to take words, put them in my mind, and have them enter my heart. And so when I read these words and I picture the disciples blurting out this 
um, we want to sit on your right and your left. And, and all it says in verse 38 is that Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Okay? But I don't think it would happen that way. When the laughing settled down, and he patted them on the back, gave them a hug, gave them a high five, says, you jerk, you missed the whole point. You have no idea what you're asking. And I think there was a long pause, and they're going, oh, I think you asked the wrong question. Maybe it's not there. It's just flat words. Then Jesus must have thought a little bit, or to explain, he realized that he needed to explain that they had no idea what they're asking, and he just took one. They didn't know what they're asking on many, many different fronts, but he just went on this one, because he had just told them a few minutes before about going to Jerusalem to suffer and die on the cross, and, and he talks to them about, you don't know what you're talking about. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup? So he goes to the, the imagery of the cup of suffering and the baptism in suffering, meaning being immersed. This has nothing to do with being Baptist, this baptism this use of the word baptizing, it uses, it's a Greek word that means being immersed. And he says, you won't be able to suffer the way I am going to suffer. There, another way of saying to them as gently as he could, you haven't got a chance to be anywhere near me in my kingdom based on just your request. It doesn't happen that way. Can we picture the disciples, John and James, thinking, uh-oh, we asked the wrong question. It was James's idea, says John. Then a little more reflective, Jesus says, well, actually, remember Jesus can see in the future. He adds and warns them, well, after they replied that they could do that, and they still didn't know what they were talking about, and they said, okay, sure, we can do that. We can suffer. And then Jesus, whether they heard this part or not, reminds them or tells them a little prophecy that, yeah, it's going to hurt. You're going to really hurt over following me. You will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized by my suffering. But then he goes back and says... It reminds them about this business of where who's going to sit on the right and the left. They say that wisdom comes with age. And when I, if you were a group of teenagers, I could sell this a lot better. Because teenagers know that one thing they're not is wise. They don't even care about being wise, apparently. They know everything, but they don't want to be wise about it. And, and you folks are a little bit elderly, more elderly, some of you, and uh, you just know you like the idea that, that wisdom comes with age. But you won't like what I wrote in my notes next. It says, so does cynicism. You get better at being a cynic when you've had all these years, don't you? You can look at, you can say, burst any bubble that anybody blows up and says, this is really going to be fun. You can say, I doubt it. Reality is going to hit you someday. The other shoe's going to drop. And all that stuff we say about, uh, we know. That's, and that's kind of a, a cynical wisdom that comes with age. Sadly, without the power of Christ in people's lives, people don't change no matter what age. And if we're working, if you have spend a whole time, lifetime working at being in control of your situation and taking the control of situations away from other people, then all you're going to do with age is get better at it. And the sad thing is, as we all know, some of those kind of people do come to church. In fact, we're all like that in many ways. There are people, there are self-centered, controlling people everywhere. In fact, I would submit that if we asked all those people who aren't that to leave the room, none of you would even move. That's an easy one to confess to. Because we're caught in it all the time. It's one of those things that 
we're so thankful for 1 John 1, 9, where he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. And that's the kind of sin that just is in our face all the time about us being, trying to control others to make it so that we're more comfortable. Jesus points that out to the disciples in verse 42. He says, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people and the officials flaunt their authorities over them. We've, you've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around and then when people get a little power, how quickly they goes to their heads. For his disciples, he was pointing over there a little farther than the group of disciples, okay? And so, but he was saying this is a natural thing. Give somebody a little bit of power and they'll lord it over somebody. It's almost a natural thing that people want to be the boss. You've heard it happen to you with a, uh, maybe you're not your own grandchild, but some other person's bad child that looks up to you and they're five years old and say, you're not the boss of me. You know, they're, they're learning already. And by the time they're, they're 60 or so, they've been saying that so often and they get really good at it. Then we try to get together as the body of Christ and that just keeps creeping in. Everybody saying, you're not the boss of me. But Jesus has a word to his disciples. In verse 43, but among you, it will be different. It's not going to be that way with you. When we become part of the Jesus story. When we take into our lives the fact that God loves us so much that he gave his son to be our, our savior and he died on the cross for us. When we take that all in and we become children of God, it's not going to be the same. What's not going to be the same? This whole thing about having to be number one. Be the boss. Now that's really, really good news for the group effort, <laughs> right? Because you look over around you and you say, look, that person over there, they're not number one anymore. And you start, you start looking around and say, isn't that nice? We're a church and I go to a church and everybody believes that they're not number one. And hopefully you believe it too. Because things can get different. It will be different. It's not going to be that way with you, he says. Things are going to be different. And listen to what he says, whoever wants to be great must become a servant. The back of the bulletin, and this is the part of the service of my talk that I know that you're just about had it, eh, Larry? So you get your bulletin out, and this is the interactive part. I could have put it up on the screen, but you can still fake it by just going like this. But get your bulletin out, and I'm just going to look at it and read it to you a little, go over this, because these are from the text, and somebody wrote these words by saying, by saying that the first will be last, and the last first, Jesus changed the terms of winning and losing, as well as the terms of leadership. This idea of leadership isn't where we're going here this morning, but we like to understand winning and losing. We like to think that we understand that. And I won't say anything about the, the Jets and the ducks and winning and losing and anything like that. We're just sad. That, anyway, Jesus said he's changed the terms of winning and losing. In Jesus' kingdom, leaders are those who work to, toward the best interest of others, not parading their authority and lording it over others. And you say, oh, he's talking about leaders. I, and I don't belong to that group. But you are. If you have something to say, if you have something to show to someone else, and as Believers in Jesus Christ as followers, we're leaders. And the difference is that we will work towards the best interests of others and not parading our authority around. Servant leadership in Jesus' kingdom has a lot of can-do spirit in it. A big portion of follow me to the hard work and a huge helping of your pile looks bigger than mine, let me help you. In your role as a leader, how can you look out for the best interests of others? How about as a follower of Jesus Christ? How can it be that you can look 
Look around you and see the needs of others before you see the, your own. It takes practice, folks. But it takes a changed heart. And when your heart is changed and you look around at your world, you don't say, like the rest of the world out there, what's in it for me. You say, what's in it for the person, people around me? There may be some interchange of greetings. We've already had several. When you came in the door, you got your hand shook and, and greeted, and then we took a time in the service and did it, and there may be a chance when you leave too. Find out if you can, folks, how you can serve someone else. You don't have to blurt it out and say, how can I serve you? And they say, ah, never mind, because that's what you'll get, right? Because it's too complicated. But listen. Find out what's going on in other people's lives. Not just your church friends. But make that part of your conversation. Make that part of your relationships so that you aren't lording over the fact that we're going to heaven and somebody's not. We wouldn't really do that, but sometimes the attitude comes out. Jesus says it's not like that in his kingdom. I want to go back to verse 36, and that's not because we're going to keep going. We're, we're going to just, I want to look at the way Jesus talked to his disciples. When we're wanting to get to know Jesus, one of the most wonderful things to do is actually listen to his words. And when there's a question, in the, the words of Jesus come in a question, and they're pointed at the disciples, and we're his disciples 2,000 years later. What do we do with this question? In 36, he says, what do you want me to do for you? Can we make that question? Can we take that leap and have, think about that question coming from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, yeah, sitting right in front of us for some of us and other people, he would have to grab our cheeks to get our attention. But he's talking just to us. And he says, what can I do for you? Now there's something to think about for this morning. Jesus is asking each one of us, what do you want me to do for you? Now, James and John were wrong in several areas about their idea about Jesus and they had been with them they should know but we've been with them for a long time too and we should know they got it wrong about the type of Messiah that Jesus was going to be they even got the wrong idea about the throne and I uh, got thinking about this a little bit for Peter and, and for James and John they're thinking of Jesus on the throne and they're saying can we be on the right and left do you remember what uh, Luke writes in the book of Acts when he's describing what he heard. I don't know who he heard it from, but he might have heard it from Paul himself, but Paul was at the death of Stephen. And Stephen was being stoned, like his last breaths before the rock hit him in the head. It just, it's gruesome. And he says, I see the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God. Jesus was standing at the, beside the throne. He wasn't on the throne. Now, I'm not trying to get in, mixed up in any kind of theolo theology here in terms of who gets to sit on the throne when and all that kind of stuff. But the disciples obviously missed the point. Or at least had a, a weird vision of that that's where that action was going to be, to the right or hand or left. As we get to know Jesus we need to be ready for the question, what do you want from Jesus? Have you thought about the things that, that, the things that brought you to Jesus that might shape that kind of answer? What is it that we expect from Jesus? Well, there's easy answers. If you had a rough week this week, it would be easy for you to, to answer, I need some peace. I need some normalcy if your week has been a real crazy time. But if you've been bored all week, you might even say, Lord, I want some action. I want some joy. I want some contentment. And if we get around to it and we've been reading our Bibles and studying John 3.16, we say, I would like some eternal life too. 
although we're not really into that right now. We're just trying to hang on to the life we got. But those are all good answers. But are they your answers? Beware, the disciples thought they knew, but they asked foolishly. What are you going to ask? How are you going to answer that question when Jesus holds you eye to eye, nose to nose, and says, what can I do for you? I don't know what I would answer. But I think since we're talking about it this morning, this hard, difficult thing about putting others first might be one of those things. That we pray for a kingdom heart, putting others first. We need to ask for help for that. It's not going to be like that. We're not going to be selfish in God's kingdom. And if we believe that when we prayed this morning in that hymn, kingdom come down, kingdom come now, and Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, that when we begin this journey with him, we're part of the kingdom of God, and, and yet it still is us first. We've got some questions to answer, and we need help. We need God working in our lives. And so Jesus surprises us when he gives us the answer to the, uh, the answer to about him. He says, I didn't come to, to be served. I have come to serve. See, the disciples had that twisted. Now, I believe that we are called to serve God, and I believe that we're called to come and worship God, and, and that idea of, of God, Jesus on the throne, isn't a bad one, and we need to worship and serve that way. But Jesus coming to this earth was to teach us to be like him in serving others. I did not come. He says, I came to serve, not to be served and then give my life away in exchange for those who are holding it captive. And I'd love to start another sermon right now on all the different ways that we're being held captive and how that Jesus sets us free. Because that's so clear that we're under siege. Our minds, our time, everything demands on us. We're being held captive and, we're, and we get suckered in so quick comes back to, we get thinking that even if it's on sale, it might not be the thing to do to buy it, you know? If it's not going to serve the kingdom, if it's not going to, it's just about me. There's lots of easy examples for us to get to understand that, that we're being held captive, but Jesus came to serve and to set us free. Two ways of looking at many of the, the plot line stories that we're involved with in, that we see in our lifetime. There's so many bottom up progress stories where the pauper turns to a millionaire and the scavenger to the uh, commander in chief of a company. Even the, the Americans have their bearded Lincoln guy that came out of a log cabin up to the White House. This is the whole idea of, of it can be a story from rags to riches. And then there's the other one. Oh, and the Bible's full of those rags to riches stories. The Joseph, Ruth, and David, all those kinds of things. We, we had a wonderful time studying David last year. And how he came from a little shepherd boy to the king. But there's the opposite too. Where somebody's high up and they go down to the bottom. The glory to the shame, the power to the weakness, the, the monarch to the slave. When we get to know more about Jesus... We understand how that's the more of the storyline. He was a, he's the living Christ. He's God incarnate. He died, as, but he died as a criminal on a Roman cross. Jesus laid aside his rights as the Son of God to enter our world and to find us. Philippians 2 describes this, and let me, uh, Mike's going to put it up for us. Philippians 2, 5 to 10. This is Paul writing about Jesus. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. 
He took the humble position of a slave or servant and was born of, as a human being when he appeared in human form. He was humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We do have the evidence. We do have the clear record, the good example. No excuse. We can follow it. We can let God enter into our lives and, and change us so that it's not that way with God's people. They're not looking out for themselves all the time. May God bless you as you work on that this week, as you let him work in you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need your help. Satan tells us in so many different ways, and most of them not subtle, that this isn't true. That we're really more important than you are. And we're certainly more important than everybody else around us. But in our relationship with you and following you, Heavenly Father, we ask that you make that change happen in our lives. It's not that way with you. So open up our lives, Heavenly Father, open up our opportunities, our agendas, open up everything in our lives so that we have people come into our lives that we have the, lots of opportunity to be serving, to have a servant's attitude, not putting us first. Help us with that, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name.